The problem was Rabbi Kushner's view. Rabbi Kushner was a, an Old Testament scholar. He was a rabbi. He knew the Hebrew Bible. He knew, for example, the meaning of the word ra, R-A, in Hebrew. The word ra can be translated evil, calamity, or disaster. And in some of the older translations, it was translated evil, that God was the source of these evils. But in the better translations, they were translated calamity or disaster. Rabbi Kushner knew that, and he understood that God was sovereign, that he was omniscient, and that he was omnipotent. And then one day, his beloved daughter became ill. And at 16 years old, his daughter died of that illness. And he was so shaken, even though he knew his Hebrew Bible, even though he knew the verses that we put on the board here today, he changed his view about God. He understood God to be sovereign. He understood God to be omniscient, but he doubted God's omnipotence. He said he recognized that God is a good God. He said God wants good things to happen to good people. He desires good things to happen to good people, but he's not powerful enough to assure that good things happen to good people. Now, this was a very, very sad development. Rabbi Kushner, as I said before, at one time was very orthodox in his view. But because his daughter died, and because he had prayed to his God, to Yahweh, that his daughter wouldn't die, he assumed that God was not able to rescue his daughter. Because if he was good, and he prayed it, then God would rescue her. What he didn't understand was that sometimes God chooses in his sovereignty a different path for his omnipotence. Just because God allows difficulties to come into our lives, it doesn't mean that God is not all-powerful. He is. And it's so sad because that book influenced many Christians in the United States to doubt God's omnipotence. On September 11th, 2001, at about 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, I was driving my children to school. And I did as I always did. I turned on the radio at 8 o'clock that morning. At around 8.05, something terrible happened in the United States that day. I remember it was a Tuesday. I remember it was a beautiful day in my city of Houston. We, we all woke up excited about the day. Before I ever left my home, before I ever left the, the street in front of my house, a news report came on that a plane had struck one of the towers of the World Trade Center. At first, nobody really thought a lot of it because the way it was described was that a small plane, you know, one of those planes that just fits the pilot and one other person, may have gone off track and hit the World Trade Center. Even then, it was a big story because many, many people worked in that tower. Frankly, many very important people worked in that tower. A lot of the, the, the great financial minds of the United States worked in that tower. As, we, as my children and I were listening to the radio, I was still driving them to school. They were interviewing someone who had seen that plane hit the tower. And he described it as an airliner. Immediately, immediately I realized this was something big. Because an airliner doesn't just accidentally run into a big building like that. I've flown over New York City many times. They go around those buildings. They don't fly right over downtown. As this man was telling his story, at the exact moment he was on the radio telling his story, the second plane hit the other tower. He, he and the reporter were beside themselves. They started screaming, oh my God, oh my God, look what's just happened. And we all knew at that moment, we all knew. We,
Hello? We probably just have a battery problem. And this was the best part of the story, too. <laughs> Thank you. Are we, are we on? Hello? This one? Good. We all knew at that moment that it was going to be really, really bad. The rest of that day, for all people in America and for many people around the world, that we watched the footage of those planes hitting the towers over and over again. In the beginning, in the first few hours, there was also some footage that has, hello, that has not been seen since then. It was of people jumping out the window of those buildings. It, it, it was of the buildings collapsing. It was a terrible, terrible day. About one o'clock in the afternoon, as I was watching these pictures over and over again, I remembered. I had a friend that worked in that building, one of those two towers, on the 75th floor in one of the offices that housed one of the major brokerage firms, stock brokerage firms in the United States. We still off? I think we're off again. We, we good? Immediately, I called, just wait, okay. Un moment, we ready? You want me to keep going or wait? Wait, okay. Again? Okay. That worked? Good. I remembered about one o'clock in the afternoon that I had a friend that worked in one of those towers. His name is Jeff. And even though Jeff lives in New York City, which is a great distance from my home city, he listened. I don't think it's the microphones. He I think it's the board. Should I go on? Just wait. Okay. People did make it out of those towers, but over 3,000 people did not. There were good people, there were righteous people that died that day, and there were unrighteous people that died that day. There were Christians that died that day that were walking in fellowship with God. There were Christians that died that day that were not walking in fellowship with God. It was the same disaster that came across both groups of people. For some of the people there, it was considered to be correction. Perhaps for our nation, it was for correction. But for other people, it was for blessing. The same disaster God can use either for blessing or for correction. It turns out that my friend Jeff lived that day. But I want to tell you how he lived and how God's omnipotence can work things out even under the most difficult of circumstances. My friend Jeff is a stockbroker, which means he is very precise with numbers. Timing is everything for stockbrokers. They have to be in the office at exactly the right time, exactly the time the market's open or they can begin trading or calling their clients. Every day, my friend Jeff showed up in the World Trade Center at 9 o'clock, exactly, exactly. 
That was 8 o'clock my time. At 9 o'clock, he showed up. That day, he got to the train station to go to work, and he was late. His wife had delayed him that day. And you know how that is. When, when our wives delay us, we want to be on time. He was very frustrated. I'm going to be late to work today. Hurry up. I've got, you've got to drop me off. I'm going to be late today. He missed his train. He got to New York City. He jumped in a taxi cab. And he told the taxi cab, hurry, rush, rush. I have to be at work by 9 o'clock. And he didn't make it. While he was on the way to the World Trade Center in that taxi cab, the first explosion happened. He saw it hit right in front of him. It hit on the floor that his company occupied. Everybody on that floor died. Everybody. Because God in his omniscience and his omnipotence said, it's not time for my friend Jeff to go home. He delayed his train. He was late to work. You know, sometimes when we have traffic in my city and I'm running late, I get so frustrated. We forget that God's ultimately in charge. But the point of me telling you that story was twofold. One, to show you how he rescued Jeff. Even in the midst of a great disaster, he can tell to take certain people and pluck them out of that disaster and help them. But there were other Christians that did die that day in the World Trade Center. There were Christian firefighters that risked their life to save other people. And they rushed up the stairwells. And as the building collapsed, they died along with the other people. They were Christians. And I'm sure many of them were walking in fellowship with God. They were what we might call innocent. Yet they still suffered death. And not only them, because they were in heaven, their families, their families suffered greatly. And they might rightly say they were innocent. Now, no one is sin sinless. No one is without sin except for God. But on the whole, they were acting righteously. What happens when we suffer, but yet we cannot honestly find any sin in our life that was causing that suffering? When we can honestly look at our life and say, this is not for correction. God is not disciplining me. It must be for something else. Is there ever a time when that happens? And the answer to that is yes. How do we handle suffering? How do we handle suffering when we know that we're suffering, yet we haven't committed a particular sin to cause that suffering? Now, tomorrow we'll, handle the, we'll, we'll discuss this, the other half of that. How do we handle suffering when we know that we've sinned? When we know that God is disciplining us? But the question for this afternoon is, how do we handle suffering when we are sure that that suffering is not coming for correction? Now, admittedly, in my own life, I don't know how many times I've, been, I've suffered and, and realized for sure it wasn't a result of discipline. Because the more sensitive you are about sin, the more you realize that we all sin every day. However, in this psalm, Psalm 17, the psalm for this afternoon, we have a psalmist that knows that he's suffering, but yet he's done nothing wrong. Psalm 17 is not a psalm that we study very often, but it's a beautiful psalm. It's a psalm of David. This is David at a point in his life where he knows that he's done nothing wrong. Tomorrow we'll study a separate psalm of David, Psalm 38, where he's suffering because he knows he has done something wrong. But for this afternoon, the first thing I'd like to cover is how do we handle suffering when we know that we haven't done anything wrong? I've already given you a, a clue from this morning's message. Knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance and let that endurance have its maturing work that we might be maturing complete, lacking in nothing. There is a purpose behind it. But further, does the, do the scriptures describe how a believer might handle it? Well, it, they do in Psalm chapter 17. Psalm 17 is very closely related to Psalm 16. They give almost the same message, but this, more, this afternoon's passage is Psalm 17. It begins this way, a Psalm of David, 
In Psalm 17, verse 1, Hear a just cause, O Lord, and give heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Now, the psalmist here is asking God politely to 17, 1, 1 7. Psalm 17. That's a good psalm too, though. Okay. Hear a just cause, O Lord, give heed to my cry, give ear to my prayer. Here the psalmist, David, is asking God politely. Now, technically speaking, these are commands. Now, a, a righteous person doesn't command God to do anything. A righteous person asks God politely, so we, we call these uh, imperatives of polite entreaty, a polite request. He asks God to hear him, he asks God to give heed to his cry and give ear to his prayer. David is really saying the same thing three times. Remember, this is poetry. They call this synonymous parallelism. And for the Jews, when the Jews repeated something, they did so for emphasis. The more they repeated it, the more it was being emphasized. Think of Jesus on the cross when he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why does he say it twice? Because that's the way the Hebrews spoke. He, it was a very intense moment for Jesus. So therefore, he repeats the noun. Here, the psalmist repeats the verbs three times. He's pleading with God. I want you to see this. He's pleading with God to help him. He knows he hasn't sinned. He's hurting. He is in pain. And so this is no light thing for David. If we know anything about David, we know that he was a passionate man. We see episodes in his life where he, he's so very passionate, and he's typically either very passionately good or passionately sinful, but he is passionate. Now here he is very passionate, asking God to help him. He is suffering and he knows he's done nothing wrong, yet people are surrounding him trying to make his suffering worse. In verse 2, he said, Let my judgment come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes look with equity. What David is saying here is, Lord, you judge me. There are people all out there that are trying to judge me. But I turn my case over to you. You know all the facts. Now, I know this, this afternoon, I'm speaking to people who are primarily pastors, people who, pastors or church leaders, and we all know, because if you've been in ministry for any length of time, we all know that there are times when we suffer because the people that we try to minister to have turned against us. It happens to everybody. If it's happened to you and your church, you are not alone. It's something that happens to pastors all over the world. We do our best, we're not perfect. We don't make perfect decisions every time, but there are times when we make the best possible decision we can make. We're standing with God, and yet it makes someone mad in the church. That's happened to me, and I know it's happened to you. In good faith, we make a decision. About eight years ago, I did that. In good faith, I made a decision that one particular lady didn't like very much. And she got mad. And instead of coming to me and expressing her anger so that I could explain the decision to her, she got on the email. And she happened to be the person that sent all the prayer requests out to everybody in our church. And she used that forum, rather than to send a prayer request out, but she used the forum to spread a false story about me to every single person in the church. Now, I had an option. I could either try to gather up everybody's email and answer her. I could wait till next Sunday morning and say, I know you got an email this week that said this and this and this, but that's not what happened. This is what happened. That was one of my, that was one of my options. But the second option, and the option I chose, was to take my case to God. I said, Lord, you know exactly what happened. You have all the facts. I let you be the judge. 
you decide. I must tell you, there were some people that believed her and left the church. It wasn't a church split, but there were several good people that believed her and left. They never asked me exactly what happened. Not once. They left instead. But that's okay, because I had turned it over to God. And that's what this psalmist does here. In Psalm 17, let my judgment come forth from your presence. Lord, you have all the facts. You're omniscient. Lord, you're also omnipotent. You could have stopped it. That day, the Lord could have stopped that lady from sending out that email to everybody. He, he could have struck her with an illness. He could have taken away her wireless for that day. But he didn't. He allowed it to go through. So I understood it was part of his plan. Even though it was painful for me, I was trying to do the right thing. It was painful for me that she took it wrongly and told everybody else that. So I prayed this same prayer. Lord, you be the judge. I'm not going to get up in front of the congregation and defend myself. You judge. In verse 3, thou hast tried my heart. Thou hast visited me by night. Thou hast, in verse, in verse 3, you have tried my heart. You've visited me by night. You've tested me and you find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. What the psalmist, what David is saying is here, Lord, you've looked at me. You know my motivation. You know exactly what happened. And you know there was no bad intent. So therefore, Lord, I have purposed and I need your help to keep my mouth shut. I don't have to go around and defend myself to everybody. You know the truth, Lord. And who do you want, whose side do you really want to be on? You want to be on the congregation side or God's side. Hopefully they're the same side, but if you have to choose, you choose God. In verse 4, as for the deeds of men, by the word of thy lips I have kept from the paths of the violent. So he said, I I'm innocent here, Lord. In verse 5, my steps have held fast to thy paths. My feet have not slipped. Again, I'm innocent, Lord. I'm innocent, but I'm still hurting. I need help. This doesn't mean that it's because you're innocent that it's not painful. There were people who lost loved ones in the trade, World Trade Center. They were innocent. Some of them were. But it was still painful for those who were left behind. Then in verse 6, I have called upon thee, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my speech. Verse 7, wondrously show your loving kindness. I find it interesting how many times, as in verse 7, wondrously show thy loving kindness, I find, I find it interesting how many times this word loving kindness is brought forth when we're in the middle of suffering. Loving kindness is the Hebrew word chesed. Chesed is a word that's used many, many times in Hebrew Bible, and it's one of the most rich and wonderful words describing God. It describes God's love, His faithfulness, His grace, His mercy. It's one of those words, like the word I mentioned a moment ago, ra, that can be translated different ways depending upon the context. But most of the time, although in English we translate it loving kindness, what it really means is loyal love. There are different kinds of love, are there not? And the love, the type of love that is expressed is very dependent upon the person expressing it. Just like a few moments ago, my, my brother Moses said that a promise is only as good as the person who's making it, or is only as strong as the person who's making it. Well, love is only as loving as the person who's doing the loving. When God is the lover, he has chesed. Chesed means loyal love. It can be described as a love that will not let you go. God loves each of you. He loves me with his chesed, with a love that will not let me go. Even, watch, even if I've done something to disappoint him, he still loves me. One of the things that I marvel about is God's omniscience. Before God ever gave me life, in fact, eternally, or take David for example, like Moses did, eternally, God always knew 
before he ever created the earth what sins David would commit. He always knew it. And yet, he decided to create him anyway. In the same way, he always knew what sins I would commit or what sins you would commit. He always knew them. And yet he decided to create you anyway. You are not the sum total of the failures of your life. God already knew what your failures would be. And he put you in this position anyway. He brought you to this conference anyway. You're a pastor anyway. Now this doesn't excuse, excuse bad behavior, but it tells you God loves you with a loyal love. So if you have failed, we need to, we'll study tomorrow, we bring it to God, we get past it and we move on. And if he wants to take you out of pastoral ministry, he'll take you out. But until he does, you stay right where you are. That'll be David tomorrow. But David today is saying, I need you to show me your chesed. I need you to show me your loyal love, O Savior, of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise up against them. Now, we don't know exactly this, the situation that David's in. I, we, we can't pinpoint this to a particular psalm. But we do know that David is hurting badly and he pours his heart out to God. That's the first thing. When we suffer and we're innocent, we need to recognize God is sovereign, that he's omniscient, that he always knew what was going to happen, and that he's omnipotent. He could have stopped it if he wanted to. If you ask most people in America, who was responsible for the World Trade Center terrorist bombing? Most people would say Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. But ultimately, God allowed Osama bin Laden to convince those young men to sacrifice themselves for him and for their cause and run those planes into the World Trade Center. If I might say for just a moment, I would have had a whole lot more respect for Osama bin Laden if he would have flown one of those planes himself. But when you spend your life convincing other people to commit terrorist acts and you stay at home in the safety of your home, that's a bit hypocritical. And I really wish more of our Islamic friends, and I do hope you consider them friends, and I hope you want to give them the gospel. God loves them too, you know. I hope more of these young men would consider that. And instead of saying, yes, sir, I'll fly that plane into those buildings, one of them should say, uh, excuse me, sir, if this is so great, if you're going to get the 70 virgins and a, and a ticket to paradise, why aren't you flying the plane? Into, I'll stay home, you fly the plane. But that's not what they do. They send somebody else to do their dirty work. But the point is, Osama bin Laden may have planned it, but God allowed it. It would not have happened had God not allowed it. And there were many innocent people, so-called innocent people, that died in that event. In verse 8, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. What David is asking, he's asking for a, that God remember this very personal relationship that he has with David. And it's the same personal relationship that he has with you. This phrase, the apple of my eye, has come down into English today. And it means someone who's very, very special to me. For example, my, my young daughter, when she was born, she was the apple of my eye. It, it, in, in the Hebrew mindset, which that just meant she was very close to me. In the Hebrew mindset, the apple of one's eye was that reflection that you can sometimes see of yourself in someone else's eye. Have you ever seen that? Or maybe, maybe you're looking in the mirror and you look very closely at yourself and you can almost see a little, little, tiny, tiny vision of yourself in your pupil. Or sometimes you can see that in the pupil of someone else's eye. The Hebrews call that the apple of one's eye. And it meant that they were so close to you, they weren't even out there, they're right here. They're right here inside you. David's saying, Lord, remember, Keep me as the apple of your eye. This is a very tender relationship. Then he goes on to say, hide me under the shadow of your wings. Last week when I was in Kenya, I was able to look down from my room onto the top of some trees. 
and in those trees were three or four very large nests for birds. And th these were very large birds. They were, I think they, we, we would call them in the United States buzzards or scavengers. These birds then had very large chicks. It looked to me like the chicks were, were, were perhaps this big. So they were bigger than most little chicks. But what I noticed as I was fascinated by watching these birds, the birds that were guarding their chicks, I noticed another bird start to fly over, almost as if it was going to attack one of the chicks. And the bird spread her wings out over that whole nest and protected the little chicks with her wing. And that's the protection that David's asking for. He's asking God to spread his protective wing out over him and protect him. You see, the first thing that David can do, that we all can do, if we suffer and we're innocent, we can ask God for help. And that seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? But we can ask him to remember how much he loves us. Remember, Lord, that I'm the apple of your eye. Remember, Lord, that I need your help. Lord, protect me as you've promised to do. And that's what David does in verse 8. Then in verse, uh, then in verse 9, from the wicked who despoil me, that word also could be translated uh, assail me or attack me, my deadly enemies who surround me. They have closed their unfeeling heart and with their mouth they speak proudly. Do you see a contrast here? David is calling on the chesed of God. He's calling on God's love to rescue him. He's saying, on the other hand, these enemies of mine, I've done nothing wrong, but these people have surrounded me. They're trying to destroy me. They've closed up their hearts against me. But Lord, I want you to keep your heart open toward me. That's the first thing. When you suffer and you haven't identified any sin in your life, you can still pray to God to help you. In verse 11, they've surrounded me. They surrounded us in our steps. They've set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. They want to do us harm. Verse 12, he's like a lion that is eager to tear and a young lion hiding or lurking in hiding places. This is, these enemies of David were no light thing. By the way, back to my illustration a moment ago, you would think that it's no big deal to have someone send out an email about you and tell all these things to everybody in your church. That's no big deal. Well, yes, it is. Because you spend years, years, establishing a relationship with your people, with the people that God has given you. Remember, they're his people. We're the under shepherd. You spend years developing their trust. You perform weddings for them. You, you bury their loved ones. You stand by them when they're suffering. Years you spend developing a relationship with them, and it can be destroyed with one email or one negative word. We all need to be very careful. And if I might, if I may, please, let me just implore you one thing. Be so careful, my fellow pastors, when you see another pastor that you don't like something they've said, don't you be the person to write the email. Let the Lord handle it. You take it from the positive situation. You take it and run forward with the truth. You don't have to look back and try to destroy someone else's ministry. Please. We have way too much of that going on all around the world. We have some pastors that spend more time criticizing other people's ministry than they do teaching people the Word of God. Let's don't do that. But these people who are trying to destroy him were like lions, trying to rip him to pieces. And then in verse 13, arise, O Lord, confront him and bring him low. Deliver my soul from the wicked with thy sword. He's asking God to rescue him. Okay, this is what he's done. He's turned it over to God. He is allowing God to be his judge, and then he's asking God to intervene and rescue.